As we continue our series in the uh, epistle to the Colossians, uh, this is part five, but this is the second part of the supremacy of Christ, which we started last week. I want to remind us again as we think about this particular epistle that Paul is writing this epistle to refute some heresies going on in Colossae, in the church in Colossae. And uh, he is trying to make sure of one thing, and sometimes we take this for granted, that nothing compares with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. And throughout the, uh, the epistle, he always talks about Jesus Christ, not just Jesus, not the Lord, Jesus Christ, trying to make a point that um, he wants to make sure he's fighting this particular heresy uh, called Gnosticism, where it was undermining the, the power of who Jesus is. And uh, so we want to continue to emphasize this. And uh, today we continue this second part of the supremacy of Christ. In your bulletin is an outline if you'd like to follow along. And the introduction was pretty brief. It said, we were made in the image of God, but Jesus has the essence of God. In other words, whatever God is, Jesus is. We can reflect the glory of God because we are made in the image of God, but Jesus is the glory of God. If you remember last week, I talked about a little bit about some of these other uh, faiths and religions where they don't mind uh, acknowledging Jesus Christ. But the one problem they had is they were putting him in a category with all the other prophets, good moral teachers, and so on. And uh, the point that I want to make through this particular series is this, uh, if Jesus is not who he says he is, then everything in here is false. So we cannot get to the place of saying that he was just a good moral teacher or a prophet, but that he was God himself. And it makes all the difference in the world because it is God himself who died on the cross as we move into Easter. Right? It is God himself, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. No one else can take the sin of the world. There's no other way for our sins to be forgiven. And we, we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we are all condemned to hell without Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, even as we celebrated communion this morning. So Jesus Christ was God's choice to reveal himself. In uh, our text, verse 19, Colossians 1, verse 19, it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure... For all the fullness to dwell in him, meaning to dwell in Jesus. All the fullness of God to dwell in him. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of God to dwell in Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in him, meaning Jesus, in Jesus all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus, in John chapter 10, verse 30, he says to the Pharisees, I and the Father are one. It is unequivocal that Jesus did not back down of who he was. He is God. And again, we have a difficulty understanding the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not three gods, but one God who represented himself in three ways, but just one God. I understand it's hard to process but just because my mind is limited in trying to process that does not mean the Scripture is not talking about it. And so therefore, the only thing that's going to set us apart from all the other religions in the world is the fact that we believe that Jesus is God himself. So through Christ, God reconciled all things to himself. In the next verse, Colossians 1.20 says, And through him, meaning Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, again through Jesus, I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Jesus came to reconcile everything that was messed up when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned. He comes to reconcile us to God the Father. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this, Now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself. God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
Namely, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, and though, and though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Apostle Paul is, is going again through great length to, to help us understand that we were disconnected from God, and through Jesus Christ, we are going to be reconciled to God. And then he goes on, verse 20, he says, We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Our responsibility as Christians is to go as if we were begging people to recognize that you are disconnect, we are disconnected from God. We need to be reconnected, and the only way we can do that is through Jesus Christ. In one of the devotions um, this morning, uh, called First 15, the opening statement was this, In response to knowing the heart of God, we are called to share the wonders of His invisible nature with a world in desperate need of Him. God has chosen to use us to reveal Himself. He has fulfilled us with the Spirit and empowered us to proclaim the good news of salvation and restored relationship with our Creator. It is only through Christ that we can become this, uh, become reconciled, and then as we are reconciled, we become that light that needs to shine and that salt that needs to be out there in the world to help people understand that they need God. It's almost as Paul is saying, and we're begging you uh, to be reconciled with God. Because until an individual is reconciled with God, their destiny is destruction. Their destiny is hell. And again, we are living in a world where it's, it's a very pluralistic world, and everybody wants to be able to have their own say. And the Bible says, you don't have a say in this. Jesus is the only one that can bring us to God. 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, for there is one God, one God, and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, God's choice. Christ came to bring us forgiveness, but this is not a universalistic uh, way of forgiving, but this forgiveness, even though it is available to all, as we see in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, but forgiveness is not automatic. Some people just believe that because Jesus came and died on the cross, automatically everybody is saved. And that's a very dangerous belief. Because if we look at Matthew 7, 21, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, as he's wrapping it up, he, he has some very strong words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, will enter. John 3.16 is a very popular verse, but then very few people go through John 17, 18, and 19, or, or John 3, uh, 17, 18, and 19. I want to pick up a verse 18. John 3.18 says, He who believes in him, meaning in Jesus, he's not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19 says, this is the judgment, that the light came into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. The judgment is that Jesus comes, the light of the world, he comes, and mankind rather enjoy darkness because of their evil behavior. They don't want the light, no one wants to have the light shine on us because they may see all our faults. And so we rather be in darkness so that way nobody sees what's going on. And we rather continue to do evil than to recognize, wait a second, maybe I am absolutely wrong here. I've gone against God and God is showing me. There's nothing more wonderful, more beautiful than when God 
is so close to you that he begins to show you what you're doing wrong. Because he wants to show you what you're doing wrong, not to say, you know, you all messed up. He's, He's trying to do that because out of love, he wants to continue to help us to live life to the fullest. And as long as we're in sin, we can't live life to the fullest. So when you, when you have this privilege where God is opening your eyes every time you do something wrong, you need to know that you're pretty close to God. Because those that are far away from God are, are here in the darkness. They'd rather stay in the darkness than the light. And you know, after a while, it's almost like God sort of hardens our heart that we don't see anymore. And that's not a good place to be in. Be in that place where every time you do something wrong, there's an instant thing that happens inside of you that recognizes this is not right. So that you can turn to God and say, God, forgive me. Because God says he will forgive us our sins if we would only confess them. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Yes, Jesus came to forgive us our sins, but it's not a universalistic way of forgiving us. It's just saying to us that he wants to forgive. Now we have to accept that forgiveness. We have to recognize our sin. And this is where the world is completely messed up because they don't want to recognize that they have sinned. We want to live our lives the way we want to. We want to make sure that there's something that uh, validates what we're doing, even though it might be wrong. And we, kind of, we try to find all kinds of ways to validate what we're doing that's wrong. Not recognizing, wait a second, this is against God. Again, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess them. If we don't confess them, then we are in our sins and we are condemned. And this is one of those things, those truths that the, the world does not want to hear Who are you to tell me that I'm condemned? Well, I'm nobody to tell you that you're condemned. But I want you to know that the word of God says that we are all condemned if we're not forgiven. And there's no other way around that. Again, we talked about it last week. You know, uh, Jesus is, is so Christianity becomes a lightning rod because we confess that Jesus is Lord. And for whatever reason, people want to accept every other religion, but when it comes to Christianity, there's a sense of real persecution. I haven't seen too many persecutions going on with these other religions. Think about it for a second. Which religion do you know has been persecuted? Now, we we recognize that the Jewish people have been persecuted, but not necessarily for their religion. There could be some other stuff there. But they're still God's chosen people, and maybe that's part of it. But besides that, I don't see anywhere where any other religion is really persecuted so blatantly as Christianity is. There's got to be something about this Jesus Christ, as we talked about last week, that causes an unrest in people's lives. Because Jesus is God, and he is blatant. He says, it's either me or death. Choose for yourself this day, life or death. Through Christ's blood on the cross, God gives peace to all. Again, Colossians 1.20, it says, And through him we reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Through his blood on the cross. See, when we talk about Easter, when we talk about the cross, when we talk about that sacrifice, Again, I think we've gotten so used to celebrating Easter that it really does not make that much difference for some of us. And and this Lent period is a wonderful opportunity to refocus our attention on the cross, the pain, the sacrifice that was made. It would be futile to have the cross if Jesus was not God. 
Because so many people have died on the cross. But only one God has died on the cross and raised from the dead. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His, of his grace. See, if the cross never took place, then there's no salvation, there's no forgiveness of sin. But if we're going to sit here and celebrate Easter year after year and not pay attention to what that means, then something is wrong. And by, by saying not paying attention to what that means, I'm saying if Jesus is not God, then we have nothing. We have nothing to celebrate. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that you formerly... That formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by so, the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Verse 12, remember that we were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, not in anybody else, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by what? The blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. The cross is so important to us, and I want us to be able to refocus our attention on the cross as we go through this Lent season recognizing that something incredible happened there because the Bible is filled with why Jesus died on the cross. Don't let it become just another Easter celebration, but come before God and recognize that he died because of my sins, because of your sins, and sin is just not right with God. Hebrews 9.22 says, And according to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is part of the Old Testament story. Every time they went to the temple to, to seek forgiveness, they brought a sacrifice. Blood had to be spilled. And Jesus put all that to rest with one sacrifice, his own body. But if he had to do that to that extent, couldn't God do it a different way? God wanted to show us that it is only through sacrifice, through death, because sin is so awful in the sight of God. And yet it is so casual in our midst. It's not that we're ever going to get perfect or become perfect, but there's got to be a sense in us that I have to try to do a little bit better to be mindful that God is calling me to something better than just a common life. Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. In Colossians 1.21, it says, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. We were once alienated. And I've said before, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one person that's going to come before God and say, I deserve to get in. Because I've been basically good. If you've listened to me enough, you, 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 you understand that basically good does not mean much. Right? We've been alienated and hostile in mind. Engaged in evil deeds. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 and following says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who are according to the Spirit, 
the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We need to understand that though we're not going to be perfect, we need to sort of allow the Spirit of God to renew us every single day, that we may be empowered to be able to live a life that is pleasing in the sight of God. Even in our imperfections, there's got to be a desire in our hearts that I want to live for God. Christ has reconciled us to God, verse uh, 22. It says, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And and I think that... uh, Frankie emphasized that as as he was reading. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Only God can do that. Because see, God, God and sin cannot mix. So God is going to do everything to purify us so we can be able to have connection with him, to have fellowship with him, to be able to enjoy him. You know what, we, we, go through, we, we live in a world, right, where a lot of people don't want to believe in God and the major, there's an increasing uh, percentage of people that are beginning to say that really they don't believe that there's a God. They don't believe that we need religion or a relationship with God. They're really increasing in that sense of just do whatever you want to do. But you know, the only thing is, that as we continue to do what we want to do, we are seeing the consequences of what we want to do. And what we've been doing has not been pretty. You know, somebody was trying to, to, uh, to, to sort of challenge, uh, I think it was Ravi Zacharias, and uh, why are we so afraid of, you know, humankind and the things that we want to do? Why, why do we need to, to have... To, to, to be afraid of the subjective morality. And uh, Ravi Zacharias told him, you know, um, do you lock your door at night? And he says, yes. He says, why do you lock, lock your door at night? Well, because I don't want anybody to break in. Why are you afraid of people breaking in? Well, that's because people do break in. Right? You want to do whatever you want to do? If that's the way we live our lives, understand there's going to be some consequences. And this is where we, we, the majority of people lose uh, their logic. Because unless we are following God, unless we recognize that there's evil in the world, we're not going to recognize that we have sinned and that we need forgiveness. As we think about Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross and about salvation. I want us to be mindful of this one thing. In Colossians 1 verse 23 says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. It says, If indeed you continue in the faith, We need to understand that salvation is not just saying a prayer. You know, at the end of every message, I encourage you to say a prayer. But that prayer has to be followed with a sense of allowing the Spirit of God to transform transform us. And if that's not happening, then we need to be very weary of whether we are saved or not. And in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, as we think about... Some of you have heard the term eternal security. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. None of us can come before God and say, I belong in heaven, because, again, I'm basically good. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God. In John chapter 10, verse 27 
uh, through 29 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. This is really wonderful to know that once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's something that's very comforting. Once we have truly surrendered to God, we know that no one can snatch us out of the hand of God. So it doesn't matter what the enemy wants to do. He can't take us away from God. But we need to understand that we have made that commitment and we have been serious about that commitment. Because salvation, again, is through Christ alone, right? John 14, 6, and Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We sang about it. It is in Scripture. It is the truth. And so we need to come to grips with the fact that there are no other ways. Now, how do you know if you're really saved? Number one, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered him, Nicodemus, said, Truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In John 3, 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not, what? He who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So salvation is not just saying a prayer and then leave it at that. Salvation is saying the prayer, surrendering to God, and allow God to begin to transform us so that our eyes are open to know what is right and what is wrong. In John chapter 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 says, and, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. It's not something that you're going to guess. I guess I'm saved. I think I'm saved. No, you either know it or you don't. You either are or you're not, because the scripture has made it very clear. You can know for sure whether you have accepted Jesus Christ or not, whether you're saved or not. But you need to understand that there's only one way to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. First John chapter two, verse three and following says, by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. And if we're not keeping his commandments, that's because we are really ignoring what he's saying. We are trying to sort of get a, um, a waiver and not to go to hell, but we don't want to do anything else. We want to continue in our own ways. That's not surrendering to God. Surrendering to God is to know that his way is truth. This, his way is the best way. It's the only way. The one who says, verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he, meaning Jesus, walked. So we are challenged to understand that if if we have accepted Jesus Christ, We know that we're saved when something is happening inside of us. We are changing our ways. We are changing the way we think. We are changing the way we speak. Maybe I should rephrase that. We're allowing God to change the way we think. We're allowing God to change the way we speak. We're allowing God to change the way we act towards one another because we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the ones that people will see. Has God done something in that person For us to just go out there and try to preach the gospel without a a sense of uh, evidence that something has happened to us does not give us much credibility. Perseverance guarantees assurance. 
And as we wrap this up, Revelations 2.7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. And again, Revelations 21.7, it says, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. For the cowardly, the unbelieving, the and abominable murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Again, Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. We are being challenged, as Paul is challenging these, these believers in Colossae. He says, you need to understand there's only one God. You need to follow that one God, Jesus Christ. Don't let anything get in between you and Jesus. Live for him, surrendered to him. Jesus was God's choice to show us who the Father is. Jesus came to bring forgiveness and reconciliation to the world and to sustain every believer. Jesus has the power because he said to us, he would not leave us orphans, he will send us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the power to sustain every single one of God's children. So no matter where you are on your journey, I want to encourage you to understand that the Spirit of God is there to continually sustain you. Because one thing... So what difference does it make, right? What difference does it make if we're saved or not? We're living in a world where anxiety is rising. Depression is rising. Suicide is rising. All kinds of stuff are happening that are just in, uh, unimaginable. The reason it makes a difference is because when you face that world, when I face that world, I can find a place of refuge. Because God becomes my refuge. Try to put God aside all you want, but the day is going to come and the time is going to come where everything is going to be so overwhelming that, oh, it will make sense to just end it all. Because that's what the enemy would like you to do. You lose all kind of hope. Again, when I talk about anxiety and, and, and depression and fears and all these things, I'm not talking to the older population necessarily, but the younger generation. They're having a real hard time. And you know why? Because part of this younger generation has never gotten to know God. Because their parents did not take them to church. Because our educational system has just perverted their, their minds with all kinds of liberal kind of thinking. That sounds good. That gives you the freedom to do whatever you want. I mean, you're in charge. Until you realize you're not. Because that time comes. And it will come for each one of us. And it doesn't come just once. It comes in waves where you sit back and you're just like, I don't know what to do. My mind is troubled. My spirit is not at peace. That's when it makes a difference. And if you think right now you're all good, you feel healthy, you have plenty of money in the bank. You have a good education. You're pretty smart. You got it all together. If you think that's, what it, that's what, all, all you're going to need, I want to tell you, it can change within seconds. Don't trust in what you see right now. Know that the enemy is at work, hard at work but nobody can snatch us out of the hands of God once we belong to him. Let us pray.